Satellite images reportedly showing increased activity at North Korean weapon sites following the second summit between President Trump and Kim Jong Un. And joining me right now is John Bolton, National Security Advisor. Good to, good to have you on the program this morning, sir. Thanks very much for being here. Glad to be with you. And let me kick it off with North Korea. As we know, this week we did get news uh, that there's been an increase in activity uh, around the site known as uh, Sanam Dong, where North Korea assembled most of its ballistic missiles and rockets. Are they resuming testing, sir? Well, I don't think we can really judge uh, from from what we can see. And you're you're describing uh, commercial satellite imagery. It's uh, been in the press. Uh, we, we have a lot of other uh, ways of learning what they're doing as well. I, I think it's important to get all the evidence before we make a decision. The president's obviously said he would be very disappointed if that's the direction North Korea were going in. But I don't want to get out in front of the facts we actually know at this point. Why did the president uh, leave earlier than than? Uh expected. Why did the summit break down? Well, I, I don't really think it broke down. I, I think the president did exactly the right thing. Uh, he and Kim Jong-un had had a number of conversations about uh, what might be done to denuclearize North Korea. Kim offered a partial deal. Uh, you know, the president's been very clear that he doesn't want to make the same mistakes as past administrations. Uh, and he proposed to Kim what, what he talked about, really, going back to Singapore, is what he called the big deal, that uh, North Korea completely denuclearize. Uh, and then in exchange for that, there was a very bright economic future for the North Korean people. And they went uh, around on this several times. They they had a full exchange of views, as the saying goes, uh, and it was clear they weren't going to reach agreement. So what the president did uh, was, as he put it, to, to walk away in a friendly way from the discussion. He said he's prepared to meet Kim Jong-un again. It's uh, no date set or anything like that. But uh, it's possible that North Korea will go back and rethink uh, the position they came in with and come back to talk to the president about the big deal. Yeah, switching ga uh, gears to China, there has not been a date set yet yet for the president to meet with uh, 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 Xi Jinping uh, at Mar-a-Lago, as the president has been expecting. Was the North Korean news a, a, a teachable moment for the Chinese? And now, is Xi Jinping worried about setting up that meeting before a deal is actually done? How close is a deal between the U.S. and China? Well, I think on the teachable moment point, you've really put your finger on something. And I, th I think this is, uh, this is important, what the president did in Hanoi, not just in the negotiations with North Korea on their nuclear program, but also with China on trade and also with uh, Russia on arms control and other countries, despite all the media speculation, and goodness knows there was an awful lot of it before Hanoi, uh, the president uh, turned out not to be desperate for a deal. He didn't have to come away with a success. Uh, in the pursuit of American national interest, he was prepared to risk people characterizing the Hanoi summit as a failure because he wasn't going to accept terms that weren't in our national interest. And I do think uh, that's a message for others that were involved in significant negotiations with. Now, in terms of China specifically, uh, you know, we just concluded another round of negotiations here in Washington. Bob Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative, Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, and others leading that. Uh, I believe. Uh, the negotiators think they uh, uh, made a lot of progress, but uh, would also say there's work to be done. Uh, so that it's true, as you say, there's no de date set for the next uh, summit, but uh, it could it could be uh, you know just a short time thereafter. We're going to have to have some more conversations and, and do the additional work. Well, you know, the work that is left to be done is really what we want to focus on because we've been covering this China story now for more than a year and a half, and I think it's the biggest story of our time. And, of course, now we know the Chinese telecom giant Huawei is suing the United States government. Uh, the Chinese foreign minister has spoken in support of Huawei's lawsuit against the United States, praising the company for refusing to suffer U.S. attacks like silent lambs. What's your reaction to the lawsuit? Uh, against the U.S. government? Well, you know, there are a couple of aspects to this. No, number one, the United States, along with a number of other countries, allies and friends of ours, uh, uh, some time back decided not to procure Huawei equipment for our 
uh, national security related telecommunications systems and, and I think for very very good reasons people sometimes call the, the concern the Manchurian chip problem that uh, something gets into the telecommunications system that can be activated down the road this is right. a very serious threat so so let let Huawei do whatever uh, uh, legal maneuvers they want to do I'm confident of the outcome of that uh, you know the Justice Department also indicted the uh, chief financial officer of Huawei uh, that was not a political act either. She was accused of financial fraud. The extradition proceedings have begun in Canada. Uh, if, if an American company uh, with an American CFO had done what the Justice Department accused Huawei of, we'd throw the book at them. That, it's just as simple as that. So I don't think anybody's going to argue, at least I'd be surprised if they did, that a foreign company and a foreign CFO ought to get better treatment than an American company and an American CFO would get. Well, it's bigger than that. I mean, this company is saying that the U.S. is destroying Huawei's reputation. We had Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in the studio just two weeks ago when he came back from his Europe trip. And and he basically told our European friends, if you're using Huawei Telecom infrastructure, we're probably going to have to uh, share less information with you because these are national security risks. How much of a threat in terms of national security is Huawei's telecom? Well, it's significant, and that, that's why we uh, suspended uh, U.S. government procurement of their systems. Uh, this is particularly applicable in fifth-generation telecommunications, where the presence of uh, suspect material really almost anywhere in the system, not at the key communications nodes, but throughout the system can be used for espionage or disruption purposes. This is the Manchurian chip issue. So this is, uh, this is a very serious problem. We're in intense discussions absolutely unrelated to trade issues with friends and allies and partners all over the world on how to deal with this. Nobody should minimize how serious this is. It's not just China we're worried about, let's be clear. We're worried about compromising the security of sensitive American communications uh, really on a global basis. But that's what I'm getting at. I mean, you know, when you take a look at the culture of China, I mean, espionage, uh, forced transfer of technology, IP theft, all of these things have been in the Chinese culture. So I want to get your take on that. I mean, I recognize that China can buy more stuff from the U.S. and they can open up their markets to financial services. But what else really can we do to move the needle on this?